Welcome to everyone who's viewing tonight's program at uh, Senior Resources of Guilford or virtually on the ACAP community website, the ACAP Guilford Facebook page, or our YouTube channel. We are so glad you can join us tonight. For those of you who may not be familiar with ACAP, here's a really brief description. ACAP Community is an educational 501c3 nonprofit organization it offers information, resources, support, and community for those of us who are caring for our aging parents. As you can tell from our name, our focus is on supporting adults as they care for their aging parents. However, all caregivers are welcome. Whether you are an adult child, a friend, another family member, or a professional. Each of our eight ACAP chapters located across the Eastern Seaboard offers monthly programs that address issues related to aging, family dynamics, and adult child caregiving. Presenters are experts on the topics they address, and many are or have been caregivers for their own parents or in-laws. ACAP Guilford meets each Thursday, uh, yeah, the third Thursday of each month at 6 p.m. at Senior Resources of Guilford at 1401 Benjamin Parkway in Greensboro, virtually on the Facebook page and the ACAP community website. And of course, you can see past programs from all of our chapters on our YouTube channels. We have a wonderful sponsor for tonight. We would like to thank Health Team Advantage for supporting the work that we do. Now let's turn to our program. We would like to hear from you, so if you have questions or comments, please raise your hand or use the chat box. You know, tonight's program applies to all of us. It's about nutrition. We have special relationships with food, loving some, eating some we probably shouldn't, believing that some are really good for us. Why is it important we eat well? And why it's important, why is it important that we know what eating well means? Moreover, what should we do about the foods that we provide for our loved ones in terms of good nutrition? We are very fortunate tonight and appreciative that Margaret May of Cone Healthcare will answer these questions and set us on a road to great nutrition. Ms. May has a master's degree in nutrition from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and a bachelor's and master's degree in nursing from UNC Chapel Hill. She worked for many years as a registered dietitian, including three and a half years in an acute care setting and eight and a half years in an outpatient setting as a dietitian for Cone Health Nutrition and Diabetes Education Services. In 2015, she became a community educator and advisor for that same unit at Cone Health, representing nutrition and diabetes education services at community health fairs, providing nutrition handouts, and in general, addressing health and nutrition concerns. There's so much more, but you can already appreciate how fortunate we are to have Ms. Mays with us tonight. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. And I'd like to say that I tend to like things informal so if those in the class in the area in our around the table have questions then raise your hands and speak up and for those of you at home do the same okay you will be what you eat okay and before we leave here tonight i hope that folks will know the importance of nutrition and nutritional requirements as we age and in fact i have a handout uh, that I've made looking at addressing each food group and the requirements for that food group and the foods that the uh, serving sizes and uh, the equivalents and that can be had if you would email us enough or email uh, Bruce A. Just shoot him an email and say hey I'd like to have the handout and we'll see that you get that. We can, he can either send it to you virtually I take it or we may send it out hard copy okay we would like for you also to look at the issues and the conditions that impact 
proper nutrition, adequate nutrition, to include the SWALA study. So listen up, we're going to try and go through that together. And then we're going to address strategies and resources for, that are available to help our aging individuals. Now, one of my authors, Hardy, noted that people are now living longer, but not necessarily living healthier and living lives as not necessarily healthier lives than their pre predecessors. And we only need, for those of you who can remember, go back in your brain and remember walking down the street in 1970. And remember how people looked in 1970 and their size in particular. Now, fast forward and look at yourself walking down the street or walking through the parking lot at one of our local um, malls or in our city streets. Our size has increased, but we're not getting healthier like our, our colleagues were. They didn't live to be, the life expectancy then was in the, in the mid-70s. And today, our, as we know, our life expectancy is declining and our health is, we're having more and more health issues that we could prevent. So we're not as healthy as our predecessors were. And the World, World Health Organization proposes that not being as healthy is possibly due to our ability to make decisions regarding our health. Uh, some of those could be positive, some could be negative, and we possibly are making more negative, re, ne negative decisions regarding our health through, the time, through time. So that may be part of our problem. I got conflicting information. Seniors are identified as 60 and older. The dietary guidelines actually address older adults as 71 or older. And in 2020, there were 74.6 million uh, adults over 60 years of age. That was 34% greater than the previous decade. And they tell us that by 2050, seniors are going to make up 20%, 25% of the world population. Aging, a complex that varies as to how it affects different people and different organs, okay? Gerontologists tell us that they feel aging is due to the interaction of many, many lifelong influences. And I'll agree to that, having worked with a number of individuals, aging individuals over the years. Influences are our heredity, heredity our environment, our culture, our diet, our exercise, our leisure, and our past illnesses. And when you say our culture, some of us are going to strike back and think about the Japanese and how they treat older adults as opposed to what, how we treat older adults here in our, our culture. Aging changes. The cells change, okay, with aging. Cells become larger. They start to have uh, pigmentation occur. They are less able to divide and multiply. There's uh, increased lipids and pigmentation within those cells, and many of those cells lose their ability to function uh, normally. Uh, the connective tissue becomes stiffer, and that explains why come we began to have issues with the hardening of the blood vessels, and we get into issues as they become rigid, there's more trouble getting the oxygen in and then getting the carbon dioxide and the other waste product out of the cells. So cells age as we change. With those changes come metabolic changes and those altered metabolic processes that occur lead to a number of chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, cancer, cardi uh, cancers and respiratory disease. Nutrition deficits can lead to cellular damage. You start to see the inflammatory process. The oxidative processes lead to the inflammatory processes that damage those cells. 
heart disease being one of those major inflammatory processes. Now, what's going to affect our choices as we live that it's going to affect us now and before and during aging? So our diet and food intake is going to affect our health choices. Our love level of physical health is going to affect our health choices. Um, hydration, the fact if we cigarette, if we experience cigarette smoking, tobacco use, pollution is going to affect our health choices. The communities in which we live, the availability of foods in food deserts are going to affect our health choices. Access to medical care is going to affect our food, our, our health choices. And our cognitive changes are going to influence our health changes. The Dietary Guidelines 2015 to 2020 are based upon the findings from the NHANES or the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And they reported that less than half of our older adults meet the recommended dietary guidelines for Americans. And that one fourth of the adults, one fourth of older adults meet the dietary dietary recommendations for vegetables, fruits, and dairy. That's one fourth of those individuals are not doing the amount of vegetables and fruits they need. In proteins, one half of the older adult males meet the protein needs and one third of the female adult population or older population meet the recommendations for their protein. Less than 10% of older adults in low income meet the recommendation for vegetables and less than 30% of those on lower income meet the recommendations for protein. And here's the one that I think that rings true for many of my clients. Less than half of the older adults meet the recommendation for limiting sugars to less than 10% of the total energy intake. And that really and truly, part of that is the fact that our food industry is putting it at a disadvantage because the food industry is adding a lot of sugar which is where it's really not needed. Okay, lower levels of sugar make you more susceptible. Uh, lower, level, more, lower income levels make you more susceptible to increased sugar intake because you're finding yourself using the cheaper convenience foods that may be laced with sugar or high fructose corn syrup. Now the caloric recommendations for those individuals 71 or over, uh, women it's going to be 1600 to 2000 calories per day. It's going to be based upon your activity levels and your physical levels, uh, physical activity levels and men 2,000 to 2,600 calories per day. And the caloric, end, the caloric intake is stated in daily and weekly servings. And these are the uh, equivalents, caloric equivalents, in each of the food groups at three levels of activity. So they can, they can be complex, but the handout that I've prepared will give you the different food groups, the names of the food groups, the foods that are in them, the caloric requirements, the equivalents that are in there, and serving sizes that I think you will find to be helpful. Where you can sit down and study and, and figure out, well, what is this I need to be doing for myself? And what is it I need to be doing to my, for my mother or my aunt or whoever I'm assisting? Daily, part of the dietary, guidelines includes activity levels and we the first level that helps us decide where we're going to be is a sedentary level and that includes the only the physical activity of independent daily independent living and the second group is going to be includes a sedentary plus the equivalent of walking about one and a half to three miles at three to four miles per hour. 
And then finally, the active level includes sedentary plus walking the equivalent of three miles per day at three to four miles per hour. Well, this is where I got my, uh, my wake up call because I thought I was active because I was getting out and hitting the track uh, three, four days a week. And I was doing my miles. Some days I had time and I got two miles in. Well, I'm a slug because I'm back at sedentary and I have the potential to move on up to the uh, moderate activity at least. My knee will let me go that far. So look at, kind of step back and look at what you're doing because we've got to keep those muscles acting. Active, those active muscles make us eat better and make us have better muscles too, and bones. Now, the dietary guidelines, we start first with carbohydrates. That's the thing that we both, we grow up with, we need. They are our energy producing foods. They supply the energy for our bodies. The breads, the grains, the pastas, the beans, um, the starchy vegetables, the dairy, and the non-starchy vegetables provide us with some carbohydrate. And that recommendation says that you want 40 to 45% of your daily calories for men and women. And it gives us the intake at roughly, for men, 13.5 servings per day. And for women, 11.5 servings per day. So using my little charts, you can go in and look and see, am I getting those dietary recommendations for those energy providing foods? Now, if I'm getting more than I need and I have more energy than I need, then I'm, I'm taking in more energy than I need, my body doesn't waste it. Our bodies are geared to figure out that we're gonna have a famine here in Guilford County. And when we, and the, therefore any extra carbohydrate the body very easily takes in, and once it's turned to glucose, that glucose can get, get turned in to um, fat, and it gets so it gets stored. And one of the things that I'm seeing now in both uh, those individuals in, in young life, midlife, and later life, we're seeing copious numbers or many numbers of non-alcoholic uh, liver syndrome, so liver failure. So what we're seeing is that fat is settling in around the liver and is causing us more metabolic issues. And the scary thing about it is you don't know you have it. It's not, there's no diagnostic criteria so far except to find that um, CT scan. So you want to eat enough but you don't want to have an excessive amount of carbohydrate intake, aka lots of times in the form of glucose or in the form of sugar. <clears throat> fat, the dietary guidelines, fat serves as stored energy. It's the energy, it's the substance that's found that makes up the muscle cell membranes. It composes the hormones and the enzymes in the body. We need fat. And that includes the fat on the meat, in the meat, the fat in the bacon and the cheese, but and the butter and the cream. But it's also the healthy fat in the avocados and the oils and the seeds that we we all will use, or hopefully we're able to use. And that should be 20 to 35 percent of my daily calories. And for women, sedentary men, 27, 27 to 30 grams per day. And for women, roughly about 22 to 25 grams per day. We can look at the equivalents, or most often, I recommend if you're looking to zeroing in on numbers, a lot of these things are purchased. They don't, you're, we're not using natural, that many naturally occurring, except in the case of the avocados. But there will be a label on the seeds, on the package of seeds. There will be a label um, the meat containers so that they will tell us what kind of fat we're getting and how much fat we will be getting. So use that food label. We recommend that you use the seeds or the plant-based vegetable or vegetable fats more often than the saturated fats. 
the saturated fats are going to are felt to be they're solid at room temperature and they are more likely to be the product to produce or promote inflammation and inflammatory heart disease. Yes. We had a question from the group. Uh, what about nuts in addition to avocado oil? And yes, seeds? nuts comes in there. Yes. Nuts give us both protein and fat, and nuts are a plant based fat and they're unsaturated. Some of the nuts are monounsaturates, some are polyunsaturates. So I, I, did, I uh, um, put those separate. I pointed the differences uh, out in the handout for them. And, uh, but yes, nuts are a good source of fat. In fact, I prefer, I tell folks, you want to avoid those saturated fats and use more of the plant-based fats because less inflammation is involved. The next group is going to be our protein group. Proteins, once we eat those protein foods, they get broken down into amino acids. And then those amino acids are used to make pro the proteins or the building blocks for building and repairing tissue. And proteins are going to be the seafoods, the meats, the poultry, the eggs, the beans, the peas, the lentils, the nuts, and the seeds, and the soy products that are available. And it's recommended that we take in 25 to 30 percent of our daily calories. And that is going to be roughly 25 to 30 grams of protein for each of us at each meal. Now, the, for sedentary men, 39, 39, roughly 5 to 6 ounces of protein per day, or 39 grams weekly. So thinking about 5 to 6 ounces, an ounce of meat is going to give you 7 grams of protein. So a 3 ounce serving of salmon will give you 21 grams of protein when you're, when you're computing it. Um, a half a cup of beans may well be six, six grams of protein. Some of the beans, it's a fourth of a cup, will give you six grams of protein. So that a half a cup of beans would give you uh, three, six, six grams of protein, and your whole cup may well give you uh, 12 grams of protein. So there's ways of using good plant-based proteins as well. <clears throat> For women, it's five grams of protein per day. Quality of protein varies. Animal protein is a complete protein. It's easier to get uh, those proteins in at a time. Uh, plant-based proteins are incomplete proteins, but as long as we're mixing and matching our beans and whole grains, we're going to be able to get that protein that we need. And it's not as difficult. In fact, our ancestors did it for many years. We just made the process harder as we came into being. So please, beans, peas, and lentils. And people fuss at me. And they say, but be beans don't set well with me. Well, beano works, some people tell me. And once you've gotten used to doing your beans and peas, those polysaccharide fibers that you know encompass the bean, they your body gets used to it, your gut use gets used to it, and they are healthy. That's what the bacteria in your gut uses for food, and you have a healthier gut biome if you're eating some of my beans. So start low and slow, but start trying to use more of those plant-based proteins. For the recommendation, if you're using animal-based, you want to use a lean. Use your poultry and your fish more often than your red meats. Try to keep that red meat to no more than one to two times a week if you're a meat eater. And you want to bake it, you want to boil it, you want to grill it. You don't want to fry it you, because that frying process leads more to inflammatory issues. Other factors that lead to inadequate protein intake, inactivity. Your muscle is going to be asking for protein if you're active. If you're not, you're not taking in, sometimes you will not be taking in as much protein. 
as we age, we need more protein because of the muscle changes, but we don't, for many older folks, we don't have a taste for it. We tend not to eat as much as we used to. You have reduced protein synthesis in the liver and you have in the muscle, so that it's, it's an issue there. Another factor that's going to lead to in, inadequate protein intake, there's decreased muscle flow, so the muscle's not working as well. You are, have decreased strength, you have decreased motility, so that that mo muscle's not moving, the strength is not there to help it move, so we may have the in, inadequate protein intake. Now, tools to look at how am I eating right? Is my mama doing like she needs to? You can use calorie charts for counting calorie. You can use your nutrition facts label to see how much, how many carbs am I getting? How much added sugars in that product? How much protein am I taking in? And you can use the USDA's MyPlate for older adults which we're going to pull up later and look at it in greater detail. In using the MyPlate, it does tell you if you're meeting your dietary recommendation, and it looks at fruits, non-starchy vegetables, the starchy vegetables, our beans, peas, and lentils, our grains and our breads, and it also looks at proteins and fats. Now, we need to have hydration, and older folks tend to have issues with this. And you've seen the commercial, and I think one of them involves my employer, kind, which the guy looks up and says, and how many cup glasses of water do I need to drink? And they say, talk to your doctor. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of a rule of thumb is you take your, your weight, and you divide that by three. So, 120, I have to fess up, 120, divided by three is 40. So that needs that means I need 40, at least 40 ounces, kind of rule of thumb for me each day. And that's a quart plus eight ounces, okay? And that's, that's my, that's fluid that I think I know when I see. And then there's other sources. So the, the fluids that I know when I see are gonna be my water, my coffee, my tea. It's gonna be my hot chocolate. It will be the glass of juice I drank this morning. It's also going to be the soup. It's going to be the broth. It may be that I ate a lot of cucumbers that day, or I ate some watermelon, or lettuce, or tomatoes, or strawberries. You're getting fluids from there also. And so luckily, when you're getting those intake, you get some triggering of that, of the, that flow through the kidney, and that may trigger that thirst mechanism so that you're not as thirsty if you're doing a lot of these these other things but roughly aiming for that one third of your body weight in ounces now my mind plate for older adults this gives you a breakdown but if we put the real foods on there you see we've got the meat we've got the whole grains we've got the fruits and we've got those non-starchy vegetables. So we've got the starchy whole grains, and we've got our dairy rep rep representation. Now, my play is gonna be half of it. I'm gonna choose to fill it with steamed broccoli, and I'm gonna put a fourth of it. I may have three ounces of baked salmon over there. I'm getting at that healthier protein there. My steamed broccoli is that non-starchy, vegetable that's going to be green and rich in vitamins and minerals particularly. I'm going to be getting a lot of um, antioxidants that come with that nice green vegetable. And remember, the brighter the colors, the better, the better, more antioxidants and vitamins and minerals you're going to get. Now, fourth of that plate is going to be filled with, say, some rice. And that for me, that's going to have to be a white rice, maybe, or a brown rice mixed with wild rice, which is a seed. So I'll use that mixture. And then I'll have a side dish of baked apples. That's going to be my dessert, two-thirds of a cup. And then I may use water. Or if I'm trying to keep up my calcium, 
I may be using a side of, um, of, of meal. I may get some calcium in my meal. So, fruit, my recommendation is going to be one and a half to two cups daily. So I snag two thirds of a cup with my baked apples. My non-starchy vegetable recommendation is two to three cups. I've got a cup of broccoli, so I'm hitting, I'm, I'm doing good with the non-starchies. My starchy vegetables, I'm supposed to get five to seven ounces of a grain equivalent. So roughly that half a cup is one ounce. So I've got six, four, four, to, four to six more ounces to get in during the day or an ounce equivalents. And my protein, three ounces, I'm supposed to have five to six, so I've got there. So some of the protein may come if I use, in, I'm also going to get some protein in my, if it's a brown rice, I'll get some there, and I'll get some protein also from those seeds. So I'm sneaking in some other protein <coughs> sources there, but I'm working on it. Now. As we age and we try to meet those dietary recommendations, we have other changes. Our metabolic processes do not work as well. In fact, we do not metabolize the nutrients from our foods as efficiently. And so we have examples of our glucose levels remaining elevated following meal. Thus, diabetes may become an issue. Um, the Build up of muscle, the anabolic process is less efficient. And in fact, after age 50, adults who do not exercise lose an average of 0.4 pounds of muscle mass each year. And I don't know about some of the rest of you, but I don't like looking and seeing how my muscles have changed since I started the, this retirement process. So, how do you offset those changes in aging? Keep moving. We recommend, it's recommended we do that 30 minutes of cardio exercise, and that's that walking in particular that we older adults can use. So walking for 30 minutes, five days a week, gives us that 150 minutes that is recommended for us. Now, it doesn't have, you know, you don't want to do a slow slug saunter unless that's where you're starting. And if you are doing it, if it's a slow slug walk, that's okay where you start. But work up to where you can get a brisker walk. Pick up your pace as you, your muscles get stronger. If your heart, as your heart and lungs get stronger, then pick up that pace. So that if actually you're one of those younger adults or those adults that can walk a good pace, being able to walk so you can talk to maybe yourself or you can talk to the person beside you and not get short of breath, that means you're, you're getting up to the aerobic level. You want to try to do some muscle strengthening and resistance exercises to maintain that muscle and bone integrity. It also helps with improving coordination and mobility. So it may be your exercise bands, it may be your weights, it may be your Pilates class if you're able to do it. But take on some of those resistance exercises. Other lifestyle strategies. Consume a healthy diet low in processed sugar. Um, sugar has no nutritive value and fiber-rich foods, no nutritive value, while complex carbohydrates, you want to increase those, they will aid in digestion, help in moderating blood glucose and blood cholesterol levels. Other lifestyle strategies besides exercise and a diet low in sugar and high in complex carbohydrates would practice good sleep habits. Uh, those habits, that have uh, like a quiet, cool room, uh, avoiding blue light before you go to bed, and avoiding caffeine in the afternoon and extra long naps in the afternoon. And lifestyle, the next lifestyle strategy is promoting good health, 
or incorporating good health promoting um, behaviors into your life. So start out trying as, as early as you can, trying to maintain a good weight to be active and to um, try to reduce the, reduce the risk for chronic conditions such as heart disease and uh, diabetes, uh, respiratory disease, et cetera. Wants to help you increase, and I hear about decrease, you want to increase that independence of older age through those behaviors. Any questions so far? Is every, I hope you're not asleep yet. Yes? So um, if someone's physically not able to be active, right. um, what do you recommend in terms of adjusting their As their active diet? as they, as, as adjusting what? Uh, their diet or their nutrition okay. based on their inactivity. Their inact, that we're going to have to, to make, put their calories at a level that will meet their needs. Make sure they're getting adequate amounts but you wouldn't need the caloric or the energy calories that you would possibly need if you're more active. Yes. You would find out what they're doing, what they're currently eating. Uh, you would have a height, you would get, or try to get a, a standard, a height standard and a weight for them and look at what they were actually able to do. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have a calorie amount. What's your thoughts about uh, supplemental drinks, you know, the boost and the insurers okay. and so forth. They are good, but I don't think we need, as I will say later, we need to look at what we're doing. Are we using them instead of food? And if they, if there are issues that they really need them, yes. Um, but I, I hate using those whenever they could be chewing and they could be using food as opposed to using the, the supplements. And supplements there, uh, I'd say getting advice from your physician or my application is they are, there are so many supplements out there. You really need to tailor it to the individual. So it takes me a while sometimes to arrive at which supplement is really good for this particular person and their particular needs. So that's for our so get the, get the assistance of an RD if you possibly can. Now, resources. Uh, congregate nutrition. Here in the county, here in Guilford County, we have those. Uh, they provide meals to folks 65 and older and their spouses, and they meet at senior centers, at schools, and in churches. And I know down in my neighborhood in the southeastern part of the county, I think of Mariah Church. And I think they meet monthly, mm -hmm. don't they? Yeah, so that's a time that seniors can meet and eat and visit and socialize and learn from each other. And it's a good, balanced, well-prepared meal for them. Then we have the other thing that we have is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. Those of us who are older may remember this as food stamps in the past. But this is to help adults who are retired on, and living on limited incomes to be able to afford more and perhaps have more and nutritious, more nutritious foods for them. Gives them more purchasing power. Commodity supplemental foods programs. I think we see more of this when the commodities get given out or are distributed through uh, groups such as Second Harvest and those come to our local uh, our local uh, food pantries and and our, our our older adults can go there or their family members can go there and get those foods for them and they come out in the form of those commodities. I know yesterday when I was at the food pantry working we had cheese we've got and that's one of the proteins that sometimes they will use when and it's a commodity that comes from the USDA or Department of Agriculture. Then the other other um, resource would be home delivered nutrition services, aka Meals on Wheels. And I was Meals on Wheels till between my job and my my family responsibility. I've had to give that up, but I look forward to a time when I can get back to doing Meals on Wheels because. You've got to know 
your folks and you got to see them and you knew when things were awry and you were able to put in that call to see your resources to say so and so is not answering their phone they're not coming to the door those kinds of things so it's more than just providing food for them supporting adults in eating if we can have adults in uh, or if we can encourage them to, uh, to group with other individuals to have meals, that sharing, that support time. And sometimes if you've got a group that's doing meals, maybe you're in your, in your complex, maybe you, three or four of you meet once a week, or maybe it's in your church. Some of your friends from church or will come and you will meet and one of you will do one dish. It, it can be a potluck or maybe you get to relax and the person who's hosting feeds you that week. And then the next week you got, but you get time to eat and enjoy. And rather than maybe just eating out of the microwave or the refrigerator, you get a prepared hot meal and you get time for bonding and, and experiencing things with contemporaries. And that's something that's important. So encourage that. If it's family, hey, invite that, that, that aunt of yours that you really can't get along with that well. Invite her over anyway and have her every once in a while for a meal. It's gonna be good for her. It may change her disposition, who knows. When you're working with older adults, remember that they have issues with chewing and swallowing. So remember that if you're fixing a meal, don't have a dry chicken dish if you know that person is already having issues with dry mouth. So when you prepare that, be prepared to have something moist or cooked to where that it's tender, you can cut it with a fork, it's easily chewed, it is moist, or you provide a gravy perhaps to go with it. Um, but look at what their needs are physically. Do they need altering things that will assist with their chewing or their swallowing? Remember food safety, practicing safe food handling uh, for these folks because they have decreased immune issues and and they're more susceptible to foodborne illnesses. So when you're cooking for older adults, uh, remember they're more likely to be hospitalized for foodborne illnesses. Uh, the increased risk is because of a change in the body organs and systems. The immune system's weaker, the GI tract is slower, it holds on to food longer, allowing more time for the bacteria to grow. Not only that, but the liver and the kidneys may not be filtering like they used to. So you may have an accumulation of body, foreign bacteria in the body of foreign bacteria or toxins. The stomach may not produce enough acidity to kill that bacteria before it goes into the stomach. Um, you may have underlying conditions that also increase the risk other for like diabetes and cancer that increase the risk for foodborne illnesses. If you're 65 or years or older or you prepare food for older individuals, always wash your wash hands, utensils and surfaces so that you're not spreading germs. Separate the raw products from such as the raw meat and poultry and seafood from the vegetables. Okay, because germs spread at the drop of a hat. Cook food safely. Make sure the inter internal temperatures are high. Look in the front of your cookbook and see what temperature do I need to cook that to. And find yourself, go to Walmart and get yourself a cheap little thermometer. That will help you out. Chill foods that need to be refrigerated within two, hour, within two hours and if they have been exposed to high temperatures within one hour. Um, yes. We do have a question. Uh, <clears throat> so how would the acidity in the stomach be um, assessed so we know if there's enough or something else we need to be done? We might not know. It can be done by a physician. We, if, or 
uh, gastroenterologist. But we know that it is decreased, but if they're having problems with food not getting digested, and, and I'm, I, will allude, uh, I will allude to this later, uh, a lot of the proton pump inhibitors decrease the gastric acidity and that sets folks up for some digestive issues. Um, and it also, you also start to see yeah, the, the gastric acidity. It's hard to, you, you almost need to, to get down there and, and get a sampling and then look at the acidity. But if they're complaining of inadequate digestion, if they're feeling bloated and full and eating less, or they're having more issues with constipation, you may want, the doctor may choose to investigate further and start to look at where might acidity. I hear a lot about, about reflux. Is that something that might signal that? Reflux um, might well. There's more foods. Food is going through slower and it's staying in the <clears> stomach <throat> longer and it's not getting broken down. The acid is not there to function effectively. And that reflux is what leads us to use those proton pump inhibitors to decrease that acidity. So yes, it's it's talk with your family physician if you're having issues such as you feel like you're not digesting properly. Um, other issues impacting nutritional intake are going to be undernutrition or malnutrition. Asking for supplementation, like you were speaking about, dental health, dysphagia, and swallow issues, and other foods, food safety issues. Uh, the World Health Organization notes that oral supplementation with dietary advice should be recommended to older people affected by undernutrition. And they actually found that sometimes if you gave them the dietary advice and then you didn't necessarily have to follow with the supplementation. They were able to learn how to use their diet and the foods around them rather than doing supplementation. However, supplementation sometimes is convenient to, be, to use, but make sure that you're getting, a, I'd like for you to make sure you're getting really what you need. You're meeting all the nutrient needs specifically to where you're at. There's a wide variety. I, I don't know how many hundreds of supplements there are out there. And they range from the ones for kidney, you know, you've got two or three for kidney failure. You've got the ones to use with diabetes. You've got the ones that need to be used with chronic obstructive pulmonary and lung disease. So there's a lot out on the market. Uh, so, I guess I'm being, being prejudiced, but if you get the opportunity, touch base and you get a doctor's order, touch base with that RD, that registered dietitian, so she can go help you look at what it is you might really be needing. Oral problems in our older population, you have an increased risk for dry mouth, with age, medication uses, certain health conditions. We have problems with taste, chewing and swallowing. We may have mouth sores with or without dental use. We may have gum disease and tooth decay and yeast infections in the mouth. So all these things sound like something I don't want and I don't want to have to deal with, but they are there in our older population. So. And we are at, many of us older folks are at the mercy of that. And what happens is when we begin, when we leave our jobs or we become a Medicare, we cease to have dental insurance. That's a commonality between many older individuals. Some Medicare, some of the Medicare Advantage plans <clears throat> do have dental plans that are included Others do not, and so we end up having to buy our own dental supplement. Otherwise, it can be anywhere from, what, $250, $300 twice a year if you do your twice-a-year dental checkups and cleanings. It can run that high, and that, on a limited income, is difficult. So that's why 
we often see um, these dental in, uh, dental issues that will affect how we eat. The American Dental Society says brush two times a day using that soft, brush, stop, soft bristle brush and a fluoride paste. Uh, floss once a day, see your dentist regularly for checkups, which like I said, some people have an issue. Avoid sweets and sugar sweet beverages and don't smoke or use tobacco products. That is all influence our teeth and our gums. Now, as we age, we may start to have issues with swallowing, and many of those are neurologically, um, neurological changes. They may be the results of radical neck surgery, um, head injuries, strokes. Um, the, result, the results may lead to complications, and um, following that head injury, you may have swallow issues, but the complications in diseases such as Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, we may well see swallow issues in those. The individual that is at risk for the, and experiencing the swallow study would, or swallow issues, would be asked to do a swallow study. And sometimes the um, speech therapist will go ahead and do something at the bedside. It's kind of a rough estimate. It's oftentimes with water because we want to use the least, the least uh, invasive or the least irritant that we can get. And that's what they will use is the water. And then that will lead us to do a swallow study. If the person we know is coughing or having issues when they do try to eat or to take fluids, that's a, a, a a warning signal that we need to move to find out what's really going on with them. During the process, the person is asked to swallow a barium containing or coated food, and there are different consistencies, and while it's being done, the individual will be in fluoroscopy, and the barium will illuminate, and the the speech therapist and sometimes the physician will be watching what's really going on during the process. It will also be videotaped and they will or be videotaped so that they will be able to see the actual motions, what's going on with the muscles of the mouth, what's going on with the muscles of the tongue, what's going on with the posterior pharynx, how is the, the liquid is this is the yeah, the, the trachea is the esophagus, uh, is, are things getting, uh, getting open in there? Are things traveling down at a good rate? Are they moving in? And the images are looked at and, and, and how things are progressing and then a prescription is made as to what needs to be done. Yeah, and Oh, okay. So, uh, images show problems of the coordination of the muscles and tongue. And so, foods, remember that foods and liquids in the lung lead to aspiration pneumonia. And that's one of the issues we're really concerned about. And uh, so, that explains the benefit of doing the uh, swallow study. And also, as the swallow diagnosis is made, the individual may be taught certain exercises to assist in the coordination of swallowing and re-stimulate the nerves and the swallow reflex. And textures can be changed. And that's where it really comes in handy if you've got a speech therapist and an RD working together because they can together look at the foods the person likes the consistency and how the textures might be changed so that they can continue to have some of the, those tastes and that they have come to enjoy over the years, but in a texture that's safe for them. And as I said, speech therapy, working with the RD, and if you get the opportunity, if you know that your family member is having 
um, going to be having a swallow study, think about asking for that RD to come in and give you a hand in assessing what they did previously and what they currently can do. Okay. People are living longer. It's an imperative that those of us who are younger take care of ourselves, start to inc incorporate many healthy lifestyle measures, and given the many factors impacting upon our health, we need to lay down a sound foundation for our, our aging process. And we also need to support our families and our peers as they age and live through the aging process. Now, any, any questions from any of you? Are we awake? No, oh, we're checking. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. May has just given me so much to think about, and I learned so much about how the body works in terms of nutrition. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I want to thank again Health Team Advantage for sponsoring our program tonight. Our program next month is a very interesting and timely program. It'll be on December 14th, and the topic is Tips for Navigating a visit with your folks at the holidays. This is a time when we may see people we don't really get to see very often. And we may want to, we will be talking about how to do that gracefully, how to do that with joy, but also how to use that opportunity to see what our folks may be needing that we don't know about until we spend some more time. So please come to that. I want to tell you that next month month's meeting is on December 14th at 6 o'clock, but it is entirely virtual. We know you're busy, so we will do this entirely online at our usual time. We will come back together again in January, uh, right here at Senior Resources of Guilford, at, uh, of Guilford in Greensboro. If you can't be here physically, we will be live streaming, but we really hope you'll be in the building so that we can talk with each other as well as learn some new information. If you'd like to be notified about our upcoming programs, please like us at our Facebook page, Guilford, ACAP Guilford, or register for any upcoming program on our website at acapcommunity.org. Thank you so much. We'll see you next month.